Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. This week, so it's minus 49 with the wind chill. A frozen plane gets Joe's blood boiling. You can either do it the right way or you can argue about it. A mercy mission after a power failure. The whole town's blackout. Becomes a crisis in the cockpit. Engine fire three. And Joe celebrates a big birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, my aunt. By taking the stick of a chopper. Oops, that is that I'm on. <laughs> for the first time in his life. Hang on to your hats, boy. In the air over the Mackenzie Valley, Captain Devin Brooks and Buffalo Airways C-46 crew are heading toward the tiny community of Delaney. Guess I forgot you. A little cold. The old girl don't like going out. Yeah, it's just a normal Monday morning. Two stops, Delaney first. Today's delivery is the main source of food and supplies for their two stops. Uh, what, you just quit? And in this record cold winter, it's the worst time to lose a cockpit heater. That whole week was just a nightmare. 46 below with the wind chill. You know it's cold out when the fucking heaters just drop 40 degrees. As cold as it might get inside the plane, the plunging temperatures have been much harder on the isolated towns below. For the six years that I've lived here, this has been the coldest, harshest winter that I've, I've experienced. Ugh, it was 43 and fucking the well. Oh, yeah. Brutal. The morning weather calls for minus 43 in their final stop, Norman Wells. And the town might have a much bigger problem. Hey, Roger, I have a message when you're ready to copy. Go for 5 They want you to call company there. Apparently the power's out in the wells. Oh, oh great. We're in the two below, man. Are you kidding me? We got a Oh, no. If the electrical blackout has hit the natural gas plant, the town could be stuck without heat. The crew's first priority is to make their delivery here in Delaney. Nice one. Now Devin needs to get an update from Buffalo about their final stop. Can I use your phone for a second? Hey, Devin. Yeah, Norman Wells is out. Yeah, power. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, yeah, just come home. Yeah, we'll try again tomorrow. Thanks. The whole town's blackout. All of Norman Wells. At 43 below, it's pretty much a state of emergency, so they're heading, uh, nobody wants their food, nothing's open, because nobody wants to open their doors, they'll lose 10 degrees of everything right away, so. It's terrible timing for Norman Wells. Oh, God, the power goes out just on the worst possible days, doesn't it? Yes, boy. Oh. There's no delivery to the wells today. And until Buffalo can get them their food, the town is in crisis. Down in Hay River, Buffalo Joe's on a forced break from work. You know, I don't even know where this place is. He's being sent on a hunt for a piece of his past. I'm like a tourist, I'm trying to find a place. Joe's turning 69 in a few days. Is this it here? And his daughter, Kathy, has set up a very unique birthday surprise. He's worked so hard his whole life 
That's all he's done is work, work, work. Maybe this is dead here. And Kathy's picked the perfect person to unveil it, Joe's granddaughter, Robin. You ready to show Grandpa the property? <laughs> show him around? Yeah, I'm ready. What do you think he's gonna think? I don't know. We'll see, I guess. Hello. Hey, Grandpa. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, how are you? Hey. They have such a different relationship with Joe. When you work for him, he forgets your family, you're just an employee sometimes, but Joe loves his grandchildren. You gonna live in here, Joe? Uh, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> it's not good enough for that. Nothing can make him melt or smile or just stop the world than one of his grandkids. Kathy's whole family has been working on a one-of-a-kind project. We're building basically a northern resort with adventure centers and yurts and cabins and camping. They're getting six cabins built that way, and they're each going to have a theme. And at the heart of the resort is a recreation of Joe's childhood. Well, there's a nice cabin. Yeah, it's the prospector's tent. Well, that's the prospector's cabin. Yeah. This is a very, very nice setting here for people. Yeah, it is a nice spot. This, this prospector's cabin is a carbon copy of the places where Joe grew up. Oh, yeah, yeah. here's that. Well, a wood fire on canvas and raw lumber mm -hmm. gives you a smell that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. It makes you want to start throwing maybe some pancakes on this fire. <laughs> so did you really grow up in one of these places? Mm -hmm. Did you? Yeah, my dad had lots of these. Spend your we're, we're on Cameron you? Bay, Sawmill Bay. And I know four places. Yeah. I could show you where I lived in one of these. Joe's father, Red, spent years crossing the north in search of gold. For young Joe growing up, these remote outposts were home. Well, my parents were in the mining business. And at that time, of course, it's in the 40s, and they're always chasing an elusive mother load. We were the only two kids in this camp, it was Mary, my sister, and myself. The people that, that were in these properties were gamblers and fortune seekers. They weren't uh, marching to any city drum. Their survival depended strictly on their wits. And also on the aircraft that began to fascinate young Joe. The airplane was a lifeline, and, and that, the airplane changed the whole day, and the airplane had oranges, grapes, and cookies, and mail and stuff on it. Uh, strange faces. Growing up in a mining camp with the with the airplanes would be the same as the farm boy growing up in a farm. He's surrounded with his tractors, and at a very young age, he takes off and starts driving the tractors, and that's uh, really what it, it was like. And I was young and, and had big ears and big eyes. I just absorbed it all. Now the family's got some more plans for Joe's afternoon. If you want to go in reverse, you just hit this button again, and then it'll go reverse. Oops. Oh. This is a long way from the cockpit of Joe's DC-3. The day has been a nice break for the boss, but there are big problems brewing for him back at the hangar. Early the next morning, the latest cold snap has hit Yellowknife, and the timing couldn't be worse. Oh, it's so nice cold out there. Oh, boy. So normal wells, the power's being put back on. Uh, somewhat, everything is back normal, but the extra 6,000 pounds has cost us now to get the DC-4 ready. You know, it's minus 40 out there. They got the four engines. It's going to take them a bit, but we're going to get everything going and uh, race against the clock, get the food delivered, so uh, this boy's got a big job ahead of him. Morning before, always. The DC-4 has the size to deal with the backlog load, but it's been sitting frozen on the ramp for a week. That one and that one, eh? Pretty much if it's not running right now, it's busted. Co-pilot Graham Ferguson is going to need every frost fighter heater on the ramp to get the plane thawed out. Cold. Today? I don't know. It's minus 49 with the wind chill. It's cold. Any exposed skin is burning. In most places, they won't even let you out there. If it's that temperature, they'll let you out there for five minutes at a time. 
But Norman Wells can't wait for better weather. It's life or death. They need those supplies to live. It, because of us, they, they have food on their shelves. Without us, it's, it's really hard for them to survive. We'll leave the heat on it until we got everything, and then we'll go. It's cold. Captain A.J. DeCoast and his crew need to get in the air now. I had five uh, supposedly working frostfighters, so I should have been OK. Of course, one of those bit the dust on me. And I'll pull them off this side. I'll get them started on this side. Then we'll do the other side. You're thawing everything, cables, wires, hoses, gauges, radio instruments, everything. Because nothing works in the cold. Normally, we'll have about an hour of heat put onto the cockpit, so it's all hot, warm. They didn't have a heater available, so the cockpit was basically uh, frozen before, before we got going. It moves and it bounces. You can fire out the right side, then I'll intend the left all right, side. Great. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah. They need to be absolutely certain that the engines are warm enough to fire up or risk mechanical failure in the air. Watch yourself, I'm starting them up. can take off, the crew needs to perform a vital test. During our run-up, we're um, required to check draw on the feathering pumps, which changes the angle of the propeller in case of engine failure. If the pump doesn't work, the plane isn't allowed to fly. That is quite the fucking drop. Yeah. One of the feathering pumps is draining too much power from the engine. I don't like that draw, though, on number three, though, on that feathering pump. Again, it's 54 below, so the pumps and the oils are, are pretty cold. Well, let's take a look at what I'm looking at out here. Did you feather or start you? And the feathering pump itself. I got no oil, no puddles or anything out there. I want to be able to feather that engine if something happens. Yeah. When an engine dies in flight, the flow of air still forces the propeller to rotate. The feathering pump turns or feathers the propeller blades, so they no longer catch the wind. If the prop doesn't feather in time, the windmilling can create so much drag, the plane could become impossible to control. If it feathers, we go. If it doesn't, we go back. Those are bad for kind of checking it as long as we did, because we could blow the motor. Don't work. What do you want to do, Jay? Go back. We came back because that's a no-go item. You can't feather the prop, you can't go. Period. Simple as that. If they can't get going, there will be a hungry town with no food, and Joe's reputation will be on the line. On the Yellow Knife runway, AJ DeCoast and crew are pulling a U-turn. What do you want to do, Jay? Go back. Their propeller won't feather, and that means no flight. What are you going to do? You get that airplane going as fast as possible. It's getting even colder, and this time they need to make sure they get the plane fully warmed up. Yeah. We activate the number two feathering pump, and then the number two prop. So that's, that's no good. It's like a rock, dude. Holy shit. It's 
Buffalo, we gotta get a job done. I mean, anyone who's here is called in to help, you know, we gotta just make sure, you know, we get heat on what we need to have heat on. That's the only doctor Pretty much we had every heater we could be working on back on that airplane. There's another new little one in the in VAU. Now the cold is striking at another part of the plane. Notice the oleos, which is the shock absorbers for the main gear, were low. Because it was so cold out, it wasn't holding the air. The airplane's telling you it doesn't want to fly. It's too cold to go. Like, the airplanes have personalities of their own, and they tell you when they want to fly. So we say, no, 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 no. You're going big. <laughs> and even as James works on the oleos, the frozen engine is still refusing to warm up. You gotta go get those big heaters. You gotta try to get the heaters. Yeah, get that thing out of there. Get a proper one in there. I got it coming. You're too far behind. The flight is already three hours late. And for Joe, that's unacceptable. You guys get our. It was not AJ's fault at all. My responsibility to make sure there's heat on that airplane. We're juggling around a bunch of frost fighters. One of the uh, feathering pumps didn't get heated quite well enough. It comes down to me. There, there wasn't enough heat on that airplane. It was my fault. Joe's calling in the big guns, a monster heater known as a Herman Nelson. The, the Herman Nelson and the DC-14 in the world together, they're old school technology. They give up 400,000 BTU continuous. A frost fighter is like a fart in the wind compared to a Herman Nelson. The thing with the Herman Nelson is they run a, you know, a larger fire risk. Like with a Herman Nelson, you should have somebody watching it 24-7. If you don't understand how it works and, and you're not willing to learn how it works, it can cause you a lot of problems. And we found that the new generation of pilots and mechanics just don't have what it takes to, to run a Herman Nelson. Today, Joe's old school solution works out. Second time we taxied out, we actually went out as we should have the first time. The airplane was properly heated up. Uh, take off briefing as brief. Free takeoffs are done. Lineups are next. It was fit for flight, which it should have been the first time. Okay, just look in the green. Uh, Jerry looks good to hear. Uh, Jerry, you're fit to fly well. 60 knots, here will. Shit happens. You know, deal with whatever you got and get her done. But getting off the ground is just the beginning of their problems. Back down at the hangar. Mikey's hoping he's found something to lighten Joe's mood. You recognize that? The first helicopter. This is that your actual first helicopter? Yeah, PNC, yeah. Yeah, we've got some more pictures here. Back in the 70s and early 80s, my father uh, utilized helicopters in Buffalo Airways as a company. You know, helicopters are, you know, amazing machines. They do a lot that airplanes can't do. Did you buy it new? Joe sold this chopper decades ago and now it's back on the market. What year did you buy it? 1970. Jeez, that's 42 years ago, 43 years ago. The first thing they hired us to do was, was spray the town for mosquitoes. We did that in May, and right away, this, the fire started in June, so this helicopter spent that first summer moving the crews around the head of the fire. What, what exactly is it? It's a Bell 47, built by Bell 1947. You go to MASH, mm -hmm. see MASH helicopters come in, that's MASH. 
The Bell 47 was the first helicopter to ever go to war, and the world's first medevac chopper. It was a revolution in combat medical response. Carrying wounded soldiers from the front lines to mobile hospital units, the 47 earned its nickname, the Angel of Mercy. For Joe, it's a prize he let slip away. You know, it's a nice little helicopter. Did you buy it? Oh, definitely. We'd have to sell some cars, though. Well, I thought maybe it could hawk a couple of sons I don't really need around all the time. Oh, don't say that, my Rod. <laughs> and Joe regrets more than just letting the chopper go. I never did really fly a helicopter. I, I, I've done, uh, I bought this one so I could learn to fly, but we got busy just managing the company. So I never did learn to fly. You know, time goes by very quickly, and I was always going to take time off to go learn to fly a helicopter, but I um, haven't been able to stop the clock long enough to go do it. What, what kind of engine's in it? it, it it's got 250 horse length for me. Joe's regret is Mikey's inspiration. My father's birthday is coming up, and what do you get a guy that has everything and doesn't really want anything? A little buyer, Mike. There's nothing stopping you other than the fear of Christ and the Royal Bank. In the air south of Norman Wells, AJ and the DC-4 crew are hoping they've left trouble behind. But there's a new problem brewing. In the air, we noticed that our electrical system was kind of low. So we were hoping that everything would be fine and dandy once we hit our first destination. Well, we'll check them again in the well. Big. The crew's counting on the engine to charge up the battery. But in this cold, they can't really count on anything. Oh, well, radio 5729, starting final 09. The crews made it down, but will they be able to leave? When we arrived to the ramp in Norman Wells, uh, we discovered that our batteries hadn't fully charged on our leg up. Without that 28 volts, you, you can't really start the engines at 50 below. If all the engines stop spinning, there will be no way to get them going again. The DC-4 and the crew will be stuck. But AJ's come up with a solution. Leave it one engine running, because it appears we've got some trouble with our batteries. If we don't, then we won't be able to start when we go to leave, so we have to leave one running, basically. Right now, this engine will keep the power flowing. But once the crew gets in the air, it's going to make them wish they'd stayed on the ground. Oh! On the ramp in Norman Wells, yeah! the crew is finishing up the last of their offload. You're, you're pushing out the last pallet. You're looking at an empty airplane, you're feeling pretty good. The DC-4's prop is still spinning. We're leaving an engine running while we're down. The batteries aren't charging. They've got their low voltage. It's not enough to start our engines. If we were to shut down right now, we'd be stuck here. Being stuck here would be a bad thing? Being stuck anywhere is a bad thing. We have to stay on schedule. Job well done. All we got to do is get home. Next stop is yellow knife. Oh, no. Cow flaps, boost bumps. Time is noted. Ready on the right. So one and four first. Okay. Power set. Three sixty. You on? D two. Rotate. Rotating. On the ring. Gear up. As AJ and crew head south, their trip is about to get a lot more complicated. We're on our way home. 
we were out about, I would say, three and a half thousand, four thousand feet in the climb. Engine clear. Three. The engine fire at a DC-4 is a, a pretty serious event. You got about two minutes before that wing's coming off. The DC-4's wing holds hundreds of liters of aviation fuel. The crew needs to cut off that supply to the fire. Number four's on fire. But they're not sure which engine is burning. Number four? The yeah. number four. I said engine three, but that's not the engine that was on fire. Yeah, number four's on fire. It's not number three. Don't do anything to number three. It's number four. In five seconds, you could be in a state where you can't get that fire out. Number four, number four, okay, number four mixture is set off. Number four fuel collector off. Boost pump is off. Generators, number four is going off. Okay, the firewall shut off. Number four is full. That's confirmed. Okay, the fire light's gone out. Uh, it's confirmed the fire is out out here. Okay. Yeah, fire is out out here. It is yep. out. It fires out. I'm not gonna lie, you know, if we would have kept that engine going for another minute or so, we would have had a, a serious engine fire. You shit my pants. <laughs> <laughs> They've starved out the fire just in time, but killing the engine is only the first step. And the very next thing you do is you feather, so you lose all that drag from that windmilling prop. Before the feather. Is it better in order? No, it has, it has still spinning. The prop blades are refusing to rotate out of the airflow. Okay, how about now? Yeah? Yeah, she's still spinning. How about now? It has still spinning. If the dead prop keeps catching the air and spinning, it could create enough drag to pull the plane right out of the sky. AJ hit the feathering button, and it popped out on him. Oh, she's still spinning. So AJ makes a split-second decision. We slowed down just a tad. I think it was like a knot or two. Yeah, she stopped. She's feathered. We're good. And it was enough to engage the button and completely feather the prop. So it would stop spinning. Number four, confirm. Confirm number four. That was a good drill. Thanks. I don't know about you guys, but that woke me up pretty good. Once we had it feathered, the fire was out. On our way home, looked out there. Okay, yeah, I still got three, three good engines. We're still flying along. Buffalo uh, five seven two nine. Check that uh, we're about to leave. Uh, done a precautionary shutdown of our number four engine. Be advised. 5729, okay, did you want the truck on standby at all, or is that unnecessary? Uh, that should not be necessary, sir. 5729, we've left space on runway 34. You see the lights of home after the mission. It's, uh, it's always a good sign. Good feeling. It's a good end to a difficult day, but the temperature is still dropping, and the cold is going to spark a whole new set of problems tomorrow. Well, see, the thing is, they were out there pissing with those feathering pumps. Nobody took charge. In the Buffalo hangar, Joe's not happy about yesterday's DC-4 freeze-up on the ramp. Because it's set for four days of 40 below in that wind. Yet, everybody arrives at work later. And everybody gives me an opinion on what I should do or what I shouldn't do or what, how I should run it. So I need a few guys out there doing it instead of telling me how to do it. I know how to do it. I'm on time. I'm here. I did my job. I got to get those guys to do their job with an airplane that's warm and serviceable. Not one that's froze up. Going off half frozen three hours late. You guys think that they're going all this time, but when I arrived there, when it taxi back, we had five or six people there. Should have taxi back in. And it may, and it will again. It's you can either do it the right way or you can argue about it. I'm not arguing. And the problems keep coming for Joe. Come on, hurry up. Sorry, come on. 
The mechanics are taking too long to close the doors in this minus 40 weather. Releasing thousands of dollars of heat to flow right out of the hangar. It's not looking like Joe's due for a happy birthday. But Mikey's still hoping to turn that around. His birthday is 17th, right? Yeah, it's a Sunday. St. Patrick's Day every year? Every year, every year it's his birthday, and every year it's St. Patrick's Day. He's turning, what, 69 this year? 69, yes. OK, I have a feeling for the next 20 years he'll stay at that age. Today, Mikey's getting some help from his sister, Kathy. Me and Kathy went over to Great Slave Helicopters uh, to see if we can, you know, wrangle up a helicopter that we can uh, provide him as a birthday present. I guess we're technically a customer. Potential. They won't be buying a chopper, just the chance to fly one. So what are we talking about? Do we want just give me a few hours or? For uh, me, about 20 minutes. We talked to the main guy, Paul. He's the guy that controls everything there to kind of see if they have anything available that my father can learn on. This is, would be, I think, the perfect machine for Joe to go do his initial ride in to see how he likes feel the helicopter just it will be completely different from any flying Joe's ever done. Basically gone back to a rampy status and, uh, you know, to start from fresh and, you know, maybe feel like a kid again. He'll be a little bit out of his comfort zone, but I think he'll, he'll get over. If Mikey can get him in the seat, because Joe hasn't been in a birthday frame of mind. Well, <laughs> sakes. And back at Buffalo, Mikey's finding out that Joe's mood has gotten even worse. There's no one on the floor. Rod's not even here. Hey, Mike, like, where's everybody? I'm gonna ask you the same thing. Paul's gone. Chucky's gone. Curtis is gone. Everyone's gone. Where is everybody? <laughs> no. Everybody didn't come back after lunch. Maybe Joe sent them all home. I heard the doors were wide open, so I don't know. Fuck, it's like a bunch of kids, eh? Get yelled at once. I wish I could get yelled at stay at home. That'd be good. Go and ask Joe if he sent everybody home. Did you send everybody home? Well, you got freeze hanging out on the parkers in the back room to have the coffee. I'm not paying 30 bucks an hour or 50 bucks an hour, whatever you're paying, so I send them all home. Next time they'll think about it. Hmm. Why the no, I was wondering, because this is everybody. I went up there and there's no one there. Tomorrow's the big day, and Mikey might have found the perfect gift. But Joe might not be in any mood to celebrate. Morning DC-3 flight descends into Yellowknife. And everyone's eager to greet the birthday boy. Happy birthday. Yeah, you're right. Happy birthday. Yeah. Can I give you the birthday box? Or? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Joe has no idea about the surprise planned for him. Instead of, you know, getting him, you know, cookies or a cake, Whatever this year, you step it up and get him a helicopter ride. Yeah. Mikey's birthday present demands careful timing. Okay, so let's go downtown. And that could be a problem. The father doesn't really like to be told what to do, especially when and where to be at a specific time. He's not the one in control. Sometimes he, uh, uh, you know, drags his feet. I need my father at 11 o'clock sharp, and everything was hinging on it. He's not coming to come through that door. In a, Two seconds, I better just call him. You know, the whole company on standstill just so he can have a couple hours off. And we ha also had to keep this a secret from him. Uh, I was not answering. That made him really nervous because he didn't know what was coming. Helicopter's gonna be landing here in about five minutes, but typical Joe fashion, he's nowhere to be found. I told him to meet at the Electra before 11, so. Hey, Scott. Hey, did you see the old man over there? Is he out here? In the backyard. Okay. 
All, all you gotta do is get up and want to let the work around. Just get your ass out of bed and let the work. I always found that out. Uh, yeah. Okay, what do you want? 11 o'clock. What the hell's happening at 11 o'clock? International time signal? I think he was kind of curious to figure out what we're up to. But Joe's patience is already wearing out. I can go back in. No, 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 no. I can definitely go back in. At least it's nice out. The sun's nice. Huh? The sun's nice. <laughs> But just when Joe is ready to pack it in, we're going to go for a helicopter ride. It's your first helicopter lesson. Really? Right now. I'm just happy it was a surprise right to the end. I don't know how to fly that thing. They popped the dual controls on it. <laughs> really? That was the moment when I realized that I actually think I got him something that he liked for his birthday. That's a neat thing to do. Jeff, <laughs> Jesus Christ. What are the gods in there now? You all ready to go for a flight? You got an extra headset in there? You betcha. I don't know anything about these things. I just bullshit. That's where I come in. You should have got your beginner's logbook. I'm the insurance for your birthday present. <laughs> well, I sure can't find out like that. Jeff Ryan taught Joe's daughter, Kathy, to fly a helicopter. Don't walk downhill towards the aircraft. Tip of the blades are the concern. And he's the one chopper pilot in town Joe really trusts. Oh, yeah, here we go. Snug? Yep. We're set to go. Before he gets a shot at flying, Joe needs to understand how this machine works. So this is my throttle. This is my rotor brake. So you got one, one RPM? Like one setting? Yeah, it's governed. Even if both airplanes and helicopters are in the air, that's kind of where the similarities end. Unlike a plane, a helicopter is inherently unstable and demands constant balance of the three controls. The collective lever adjusts the pitch of the main rotor blades collectively to create lift. The yaw pedals control the pitch of the tail rotor to steer like a rudder and the cyclic stick feathers the rotor blades in a cyclical pattern to bank the aircraft. And if that's not complicated enough, adjusting each control affects the others. For Joe, it's a whole new kind of dance. You can't put a helicopter pilot in an airplane, you can't put an airplane pilot in a helicopter. So even though they're both flying, they're different. Lift off from Buffalo Hangar at your discretion. So you're, you got constant power now. Yep. Yeah. I'm just raising the collective, giving it more power. Now it's time for Joe to learn firsthand. So your your collective is your. Do it now, you change the angle of your blades, eh? Yeah. God, you're not changing your power, you're just the angle of your blades. So yeah, you increase the power. When I raise the collective, it automatically increases the power on the engine. So your RPM stays the same, it's just changing your torque. Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead and grab the cyclic nice and gentle. So it's super sensitive? Yeah, I see that, yeah. So I'm just going to slow us down. I'm going to let you play around. With the so, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go that way all the time. Yeah. Let me try this out. There you go. You don't use... Whoops. That is sensitive. Ooh, yeah. I'm a nervous flyer to begin with. Now we got a, an amateur flying a helicopter, and I'm in the back. Like for me alone, it was, it was a little bit of an adrenaline rush. Yeah. Hang on there. Hang on, craft. I'm the insurance. There, so now we can do another right hand. Just getting used to how sensitive it is. So far, Joe's showing he has the right instincts. Ah, that's pretty good. So how are you looking at that? That's good, it's good. But now comes the big test. The hardest part about the helicopter lessons is, you know, the hover. Let's go near those uh, trees there. Yeah. Hovering in one spot, constantly balancing the controls, shows how much skill a pilot really has. So you want me to stay in one spot? Like over, right, over right here, yeah. Up at altitude, 
Joe could drop 100 feet while correcting on his controls and be able to recover. Oh, okay. But down here, he doesn't have 100 feet. There you go. You don't use... That is that. On the edge of Great Slave Lake, Buffalo Joe might have finally found some flying he can't master. It usually takes about five hours of hovering to get used to it. Ooh, yeah. Hey, hang on there. Hang on grass. Balancing this A-Star 350 in a perfect hover would usually take hours of humbling practice for a novice chopper pilot. In the hover, everything's super sensitive. They don't over control. Yeah. This is kind of dangerous when something's wrong. If anything would go wrong, this is the time it would. Oops. I got it. So I want to hit this tail rotor off the ground. <laughs> oh, okay. That, that, that drop. Oops. Let me get that nose straight. Okay. I haven't quite figured out when I was. Lift her up. Up she goes. Down. I want to stop. Whoops. Better bump the floor. They're down. Pull it back. Stop. Down. Up she goes. That's actually a pretty good jump. Oh, yeah. You got it. Come yeah. On. Joe's skill is a shock for everyone aboard. It blew me away to how well he took to it. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to move back over in that direction. And uh, get Mike in the front. You know, Jeff and my father gave me the offer to take over and try my hand at it. And, uh, you know, I couldn't pass that up. This is the cyclic. How's your, put your feet on the pedal and see how you're sitting. Okay. Direction of control. I'll pull it into a hover. Okay, you have control? I have control. Ah! <laughs> okay, I have it. So I'll just recenter us. <laughs> so we'll just try it one more time. Oh! Ah! <laughs> okay, I have it. <laughs> oh, okay. got it. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> For Joe, watching Mikey struggle is an even better gift. Oh, right. <laughs> I got to see firsthand that it's not as easy as it looked. Then we'll head her back. Is that good? Yeah, the views up here is amazing. And Mikey's pulled off the perfect birthday. Very good, very good. I'll have a birthday tomorrow, too. If I had time, I'd definitely take more. But yeah, you hate to see it come to an end. It was a great day, so. Someday the clock will stop and I'll get out there and I'll take my flying lessons and I'll buy a helicopter and go fly it. <laughs>